you will take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 1. And we are going to go through the entire book of Revelations tonight. Amen? And uh, bring it on, you say. I've only studied the first couple of verses, so you're going to have to pace yourself. And uh, looking forward to our study. Been looking forward to this probably, in all honesty, for, probably for about a year or so now. Actually took a, a seminary class about two years ago uh, on uh, this uh, book. And uh, God has been just allowing some thoughts to percolate in my mind. Takes me maybe a little longer than some. And uh, really thought I at least understood the basic components of the book uh, prior to that class. And God has really uh, just nothing new as in novel but just further expanded my own understanding and then in preparation for this series. And it will take us a little while to get through the book, all joking aside, I hope you're okay with that. But a lot of truth found in this book and I hope that on the back end of it, two things will happen. One, you'll no longer be intimidated by it or just kind of read through it and try to look for all kinds of hidden messages. And number two, you'll see Jesus more clearly. And that's what this book, as any slice of the Word of God is really just a representation of who Christ is, and I hope tonight God will begin that work. Revelation chapter 1, and let's read the first three verses together, and then we'll ask the Lord to bless not just tonight, but this series as we begin together. Revelation chapter 1, and if you would please, verse number 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Notice now verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Let's pray and let's ask God to help us tonight. Father, thank you. For the joy it is to gather in this setting. Thank you for these dear folks and their faithfulness tonight. Lord, several out tonight for different reasons, several with health concerns and, Lord, other obligations. And thank you, Lord, for allowing us to gather tonight and, Lord, to read your word, to hear your word, and to receive the blessing that you give through it. Father, I pray tonight as we begin this series that, Lord, it would not be one that is sensational but it would be one that is scriptural. It would not be one that is fueled by fleshly interpretations or applications. Lord, it would be fueled by the discernment and the illumination that only comes through your Spirit. And Father, though it excites us to study on these things and to anticipate the fulfillment of each nuance of these verses and these chapters, Lord, may ultimately it be a greater appreciation of who you are And Lord, your concern for this planet and for its people. And Lord, to bring praise and glory to your name. Bless the beginning of this study tonight, we pray. Work in our hearts as only you can. In Christ's name, amen. I read several years ago of a farmer who was awakened one night by a grandfather clock that was in his home, in his farmhouse. And the grandfather clock had been in the family for several generations, and every hour it would faithfully mark that hour. And I don't know if you've ever had a clock where, you know, it dings however many times the hour of the day is. So you don't even need to look at the clock, you just hear it, and if it's one o'clock or two o'clock, one ding, two dings. Middle of the night, this dear farmer, he all of a sudden heard the chimes sequence a little differently than normal, and he sat upright in his bed. And as he sat there, he thought he counted right. The clock had chimed 14 times. And he's half awake, and he turns to his wife and nudges her and kind of wakes her up. And he says to the wife, he says, Wake up, Nellie. It's later now than it's ever been before. (laughs) Do you realize tonight the late hour in which we live? I find it even fascinating But even, and maybe I'm dating myself and I don't have the far reach back that some of you have, but I'm amazed by how apathetic even God's people are about a book like this book. And I believe that indicates we're not further from it. I believe that's even an indication that we're closer. Even God's people, many of them will be shocked when these things begin and continue to be fulfilled. 
And it is my desire that my family and my own life and this church is the exception to that. That we know what's coming, we anticipate it, we prepare for it, and as we do so, God reveals Himself more fully to us. Now may I say tonight, the Bible allows us to step back. I don't know if you're like me, you kind of now and then have almost a panic attack watching the news or hearing someone interpret the news. Man, what's going on right now, for example, in Russia and Iran and you know North Korea and the list it seems like that list keeps getting longer doesn't it of threats to our world and to our way of living but may I say tonight that through this book and other books like in the word of God it's almost like we can step back how have you've ever had a situation where you're right in it and you feel like you can't even breathe it's so close and it's so intimidating and then if you can just step back and see the big picture see see a bigger picture it allows you to put it into perspective and if you will tonight, this book that we're going to study is basically almost getting a bird's eye view of the future and to seeing the context in which we're living out our lives and where God will frame and fit each aspect of His plan for uh, human history. And so what I want to do tonight for a few minutes is look at these three verses and specifically our outlines on the back of your bulletin. I would encourage you over these next weeks we share together to take as many notes as you can and then go back and meditate. We don't have time to dig into a lot of details, but if a question comes up, I'd be happy to field that question. And basically my response most of the time would probably be, let me check on that and get back to you and make sure I give you a biblical answer. But I hope you'll follow along and keep notes and maybe transfer what you're taking on your bulletin, put it in a journal, keep track of it. And I think the Lord will bless and honor your commitment to being here every Sunday night and engaged in taking notes. But let's look at tonight two purposes of the book of Revelation, and both of them are found here in verses 1 to 3, that we want to make sure we're, we're approach. I guess the point is that we're approaching the book with the same motivations that God originally designed for us to have. Um, I know a lot of people, probably you do too, who have taken this book and used it for their own agenda. Uh, they have at least distorted the purpose of God and how they've studied this book. And I want to make sure we do what God wants with it. Number one, first of all, God has given us this book for some revealing. For some revealing. Now, this has always bothered me, and maybe this is a pet peeve of mine, but isn't it interesting that the title of the book is the Revelation of St. John the Divine? Does your Bible read that way? And then the very first phrase that is inspired says the Revelation of Jesus Christ. I, I think John would be even more bothered by that title than we are. Um, and I'm not picking on the translation you're looking at or those that have remember certain aspects of our Bibles are not inspired, the chapters and divisions, some of that's to aid us in reference. But the revelation, the revealing is not of John. It's not of you or me or some other amazing fictitious character that now comes to light. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so I would just encourage you, you notice the subtitle of our series is Looking for the Lamb. And the pet title for Jesus Christ found in the Bible, maybe make it, or in the book of Revelation, may want to jot this down, is the word Lamb, the Lamb. And we'll refer to that over and over. I didn't bring it tonight for sake of time, but I, one of the things that I recently did for some study was I went through and found every reference in the book of Revelation to Jesus Christ. And in, in size 11 font, if you use a computer, it was eight and a half pages with no spaces of verses, just the verses quoted in, in, high, in bold, the Lamb or Jesus Christ, a reference to God. And, and you all throughout the book, it's laced, it's chuck full of references to Jesus Christ. And so this book is consumed with revealing not just things and not just events, but really to reveal Jesus Christ. And I will say this too, and then we'll begin into this section. Really, the events of Revelation are really just to provide a backdrop upon which Jesus Christ can shine more brightly. The dark moments we're going to get into and the plagues and the mind-boggling epic things that happen where one-third of this dies and one-third of this happens is really just the backdrop where we see Jesus Christ more definitively. So let's look at a few things in this area of revealing. How do we make sure that we have Jesus Christ be revealed to us as we study the book of Revelation? Number one, by being a focused student. By being a focused student. Look again, if you will, at verse number one. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, 
which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified by his angel unto his servant John. So we need to be a focused student. How? First of all, by focusing upon what God is trying to show us. Notice that it says there, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. The word revelation that is found here in verse number one, that word revelation found at the, the second word of verse one, uh, is the English translation from a word called apocalyptus. You ever heard the term apocalypse? We had, what was it, 2012 was supposed to be the end of the world. You know, the apocalypse, um, the revelation of end times. But the word revelation, you may want to jot this down, means to unveil or to disclose. To unveil or to disclose. And I want you to think a minute. First of all, if we did not have the book of Revelation, this is the question that you need to be asking yourself all throughout this series. If we did not have the book of Revelation, what would we not know about Jesus Christ? What would not be unveiled? What would not be disclosed? And I think you'll be struck by, as I have, there are things found only in the book of Revelation, in the events and circumstances and details, that without them, our view of Jesus Christ would be so much more two-dimensional. It would be so much shallower. And so through this book, God is showing us some things, and we need to make sure we focus on whom He is trying to show. So the word revelation, again, if you didn't get it there, means an unveiling or a disclosure. So anything God shows us about the future is ultimately to reveal or to show to us more about Jesus Christ. All right, number two, also we must focus upon God's symbols. God's, excuse me, symbols. Notice there in verse number two, he says, so he's going to show it unto his servants. Notice, he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Signified. Um, some of us guys here that work in the, the auditorium service, we had kind of have this little running joke where we have yet to get ESP between each other, you know, where you can, and I'm trying to communicate with the guys in the back about something about the temperature or the sound or something we're changing, and we just, we haven't got it yet. And I've been trying to think of ways to get through this, you know, to work through it. Either we just need to, you know, develop some signals or I need to get some of those bright cones that the airplane guys use, but some way of communicating. And I was preaching at a church a few Sunday nights ago, actually Mansfield Baptist Temple, my home church growing up, and they've got a phone on the platform. They've had that thing there forever, and we always joke, but, you know, they pull the phone off the wall and then chalk, talk for a little bit back to the sound guys, here's what I want, or did you have a problem back there or whatever, and they're trying to coordinate. And I thought, man, that'd be pretty cool to have, you know, a red phone sitting here on the platform, you know, pull it out and talk. Well, I don't know if Dave, even with a phone, we could get it figured out. But anyway, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, there, there's a lack of connection. And I don't know if you've ever tried to signify something and something gets lost in translation. I think one of the greatest weaknesses in our interaction with the book of Revelation is that we play a little loose with the symbolism. When God is very clear what is a symbol and what is not a symbol, how that symbol is to be applied, and where God is not specific, we're not going to be specific. So if you're looking for some secret revelation uh, through our study, you're in the wrong place, and uh, I hope you're okay with that. All right? So we need to focus upon God's symbols. The word signified indicates that this book will use signs and will use symbols. And here's a state, maybe you've struggled with this in your understanding of Revelation, John actually saw what he wrote. Now, some of that was in vision form, and we'll break all that down as far as what was a vision and what was more literal that he saw. For example, I believe when he saw Jesus Christ upon the Lord's Day that we're going to get to, which is an awesome section of chapter 1, I think he actually saw him. There are other places where there's a vision. He's caught up to the third heaven, and he describes certain things that he sees. But for John, as he was either recording it in the moment or after the moment, remembering it, he actually saw the symbol God gave. It wasn't like it was a dream. It wasn't like there was kind of, there, I guess the point I want to make is everything had clear lines and edges to it. 
It was not this vague pipe dream kind of view that we have a lot of times in religious circles today. It was very detailed, very specific, and therefore there are boundaries around those symbols God has given. Uh, God transports them to heaven in chapter 4, to the wilderness in chapter 17, to a mountain in chapter 21, and he sees things there, and he testifies of those symbols God has given. So here is the, the, the way we're going to approach the symbols, and I think it's biblical. We will only use symbolism where God says it is symbol. It's a symbol. And we will be literal in our tr- interpretation and application where God uh, does not indicate that it is a symbol. And, and I've, I've heard great messages, man, they're inspiring, but they're reading into things where there's no clear indication from the Word of God that that is true. We can speculate. I can give you some thoughts, and you can give me yours, but we need to be careful when it comes to symbolism. Be uh, focused as a student of the Revelation. Don't just have fun with it in a way that is unbiblical. All right, number two. Look, if you will, now at verse number two. All right. Who bear record of the Word of God. All right, this would be John, who's described at the end of verse one, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. Number two, we must also be a faithful student. We must be a faithful student. And you notice the two little words found at the end of verse number two. He says, and of all things that he saw. I think some of what John witnessed to and and John interacted with, I think it was very hard for him to even write down or communicate or even think on, and yet he was faithful to write down and record and witness to all that God gave him. Don't cherry pick as you study the Word of God, and specifically don't cherry pick this book, which has some very hard truth, has some very inconvenient views of this world and the next, and we have to be faithful to it. And so the big picture, the whole story, we must be faithful to study it and to share it. Now, what were the things given to John that we must also be faithful to? First of all, number one, God was his source. You notice in verse number two, it says, who bear record of the, what's the next word? Word of whom? God, the word of God. Have you noticed lately we seem to be inundated with testimonies from the next life in books um, and in movies? Right now, the best known tale that has several years been in the making is Heaven is for Real. I don't know if you've heard of it, I've had many folks asking me my thought, and I always tell it shouldn't matter what I think, what does God think about it? And that specific one has become a major motion picture. In fact, it has been released in this current month. And it's the story of a young man named Colton Burpo is his name, B-U-R-P-O. His parents believe he visited heaven when he was just four. That was several years ago. During a surgery he had had after his appendix burst and almost took his life permanently. And this, this child, as sincere as he probably is, he begins to describe all these fanciful descriptions of heaven and who of their past relatives are there. And, and so all of this, they have built this storyline upon that now has been made into a movie. May I just encourage you this evening that stories like that story are extremely dangerous to our theology. I'm not doubting the family's sincerity. I think there are even good Christian folks that have perpetuated it or promoted it that have the best intentions. And yet, listen to me, it's very subjective. Last time I checked, God has not given revelation to the imagination of a four-year-old. He has given us the forever settled in heaven truth of God's Word about everything we ever need to know in this life, right? Right? And when it comes to the book of Revelation, we have to be so careful that we let God be the source of our truth. You can debate me all you want, and I can debate you on the application, and we'll get into some of that. And I'm sure there'll be things we maybe at least have heard a little differently. But I hope when you leave, and when you and I maybe have discussion, that at the end of the day, what does God say definitively? And if He doesn't say, then at least let's not make absolute statements in the area of application. And I think a lot of times we get a little reckless. Well, I heard a preacher one time, or a good man probably, good truth. But again, is the source God. He is to be the source of uh, our revelation. Now, a quick verse on that. Would you go to 2 Peter chapter 1? 
On the flip side, there are those that would say we're nuts to believe this book and what God has revealed to us. And may I just establish again the confidence we can have in the Word of God. And all of this is introductory tonight. We have to establish this foundation and groundwork if we're going to be faithful to the text. 2 Peter chapter 1, and if you would please, verse 19. Peter, who obviously experienced some things and had, in my view, an experience that trumps heaven is for real movie type things any day, saw the Christ being transfigured before him into all of his glory. Notice what he says in verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. And that word sure there has the idea of it's, it's firm, it's, it's established, it's something that we can have confidence in. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. And I find this fascinating. There's so much darkness in reference to the book of Revelation, and we have to hone in upon the Word of God as we go through those events in human history. You take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day, star, uh, the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation. Yes, that even applies to the book of Revelation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So I just want to establish that tonight, that uh, that is the source of any application or truth that we derive from the book of Revelation. What does God think? What does God want us to think? And the sequence, again, if you didn't catch it, is God gave it to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave it to the angel or to John, and then God, God through John has now given it to us. So we have a direct link back to God, and He has given it to us through that delegation process. All right, secondly, number two, go back to our text there in Revelation 1. And notice now the middle of verse 2. How are we be to, to be a faithful uh, student? First of all, by making sure that God is our source. Notice also in verse number 2 it says, who bear record of the Word of God, notice, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. The testimony of Jesus Christ. Number two, we have to be faithful to God's subject, to God's subject. I would say if I ask you tonight, what is your pet topic? What do you like to talk about? What do you like to think about? If, if your mind has a moment just to kind of, and hopefully you're not doing so now that I just said that, hopefully your pet topic is your preacher is preaching. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's worth talking and listening and celebrating. But anyway, I'll at least pretend that's true. But your pet topic, for some of the parents, I guarantee it's your kids, grandparents. I've seen you pull out your wallet or purse and flash them. You know, here's, here's who my grandbabies are. We all have pet topics. What is the pet topic of God? Specifically, God the Father. It's Jesus Christ. Everything focuses on Him. That is the subject matter. And if we're not careful as we consider these truths and these events that will shortly take place, we forget God's pet topic and we begin to hone in on our little hobby horse or our own little pet topic that's less than what God would have it to be. Now, we'll look at this in more detail later, but go to Revelation chapter 5. And in Revelation 5, we've now fast-forwarded chronologically. I'll give you the basic outline of the whole book in just a moment. But we're into chapter 5, which is things to come. Uh, the end of chapter 3 seems to indicate the end of the church age, and now we are uh, seeing some things going on in heaven. And notice the focus of heaven, that if we're not careful, is not our focus on earth. Look at verse number 11. John says, and I be healed. All right, now, I, again, John saw this, literally saw this, and had all of the emotions and physical reactions that we will have someday when we see this. This guy had to be whipped at the end of each of these chapters and what God showed him and what that felt like and what that was to see and to hear and smell and all the things that went with that. But notice what he sees here. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and beast and the elders. And think about this. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, notice this, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, think of this, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. 
And the four beasts said, Amen, and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped Him that liveth forever and ever. That's God's subject. That's what He's focusing on in this book is it's all about Him. And if we're not careful, we stray from, again, God's subject matter. So the first purpose in the book of Revelation, the title indicates that, is to reveal some things. And if we're going to make sure that we see what God wants us to see, we must be focused and we must be faithful that we don't miss what God is revealing. All right, number two, go back to our text there in chapter one and look now at verse three. And let's spend a few minutes here looking at the second purpose of this book. Look at that again, verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keepeth those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Number two, not only is the purpose of revelation for revealing, number two, it's for reading. It is for reading. And can I just encourage you over the next month or so, to read through the book of Revelation, to read it several times. Um, I would dare say probably very few of you, your life verse is found in the book of Revelation, all right? Probably when you have your kitty devotions before you go to sleep. Let's now read from chapter 13 when God wipes out a third of the population. It's just, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really evoke that inspired feeling we have. Maybe when we're reading from the Psalms or some other place. But I think Revelation is a book we need to spend more time in. And God has given it to us, given it to us to read. I know that may seem simplistic, but we see obviously God wants us to read it. God wrote it. If he spent the time to write it, probably we ought to spend the time to ingest it, to read it, to meditate upon it as we honor the Lord. I heard the other day someone said this, I used to wonder what it would be like to read other people's minds. Then I got a Facebook account and now I'm over it. I'm amazed by the things people post online. Hey, I just had this random thought. Thank you very much. I, I don't want to know what's going on in your head. God, though, gives us some things to read that are on his mind. What do you think God's thinking about? You think he's thinking about the past? Uh, he may. He, he's got the, the ability mentally to do whatever he wants. What is his main thrust, though? He's always leaning forward. And I think the things upon God's mind tonight are found in this book. Man, what's better to read and to dwell on than, man, this is what God's consumed with, and He's constructing events and circumstances around this template, excuse me, this template, this focus, uh, and so we get to read of that. So how do we make sure that we're reading properly the Word of God? First of all, number one, we read it, and we make sure we're f focused as readers by being attentive students, attentive students. Notice he says, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3, we find the first of seven beatitudes in this book. In chapter 1 and verse 3, chapter 14, verse 13, 16, 15, 19, 9, 26, 22, 7, and also verse 14 of chapter 22. There are seven places where God says, here's a blessing. And the first blessing that is offered is that we give attention to this book. How do we make sure that we do so? First of all, number one, in our witness and by having a godly witness. The word readeth that's found here in verse uh, number three it is not just a private reading, it's also a public reading. We're testifying, we're witnessing to what is in this book. Now, if you will, go to verse nine here in chapter one of John, or of Revelation. And notice what John says later. And again, anytime I jump forward, we'll come back and study the verse in more detail. But sometimes it's use Scripture to complement and to commentate upon other Scripture. Look at verse 9. It says, I, John, who am also your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, notice this, was in the isle that is called Patmos. Now notice these next phrases. For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Can I just caution you tonight, lest you get excited that you're going to start your own little group and you're going to dispense what you know about this book to that group. It's not a popular book. The very things we're going to study starting tonight and moving forward were the things that caused John, extra biblical records seem to indicate he was boiled alive in a vat of oil, somehow miraculously survived that, 
And whether it was because of his refusal to then give in to the will of Rome and recant Christ, or because of his hideous appearance, they put him on this island. I've known of believers. I haven't had the privilege yet to go there. It's out in the middle of nowhere. It's a barren island. And he was there. Why was he there? Because he had testified. He had witnessed to these things. John didn't become a popular traveling the circuit and sharing what God had revealed to him. He was an outcast because of the testimony of Jesus Christ and the word that had been given. May I say tonight, no matter how unpopular the message of this book may be, may we ask God to help it pass through our lips and through our lives so that others might hear of it. You may not know a lot about the book of Revelation, but I guarantee there are things in it that this world has no clue about. You may not understand it. They've never even heard of it. They don't know about a great white throne judgment. They don't know about the judgment seat of Christ. They don't know about the apocalypse that is coming. And I think one of the dangers of a lot of the hype that's come around some of these movies and portrayals of the end times is we become desensitized to the, the, the graphic, gruesome reality of what God has promised will come to this planet. And so we have to be faithful to witness to it. It's a blessing this last Sunday to see a lot of unsaved people in our midst, in our church. It was a blessing. Brother Billing came up after the service. His smile on his face. He was excited. We had 190 today, Pastor. Man, what an encouragement to think of how many of the 190 don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And we get to witness of the things we're talking about tonight. This is not just an academic exercise. We're sharpening our understanding so when we get the question about the news story, or the trends in our day that we can share what it means. We can provide godly context that can frame their reference as they decide how to interact with this world. I was reading an article the other day, I don't know how familiar you are with the term millennials or not. I would kind of be at the top end of uh, that age group, but the younger generation, those coming up in ministry and in the church. Someone said this, millennials have a keen sense of the awareness of awareness that they may be the last spiritual leaders on the earth who communicate the gospel before Jesus comes. This grave realization is sobering. It calls them to a clearer, higher focus, to live above pettiness, divisiveness, and stylistic debates. They don't really have time or emotional energy for illogical, subjective arguments. They see the world perishing while Christians are quibbling, and it frustrates them. And I will share that sentiment this evening. I really believe we are on the the very brink of much of what we're going to study. I hope God come, I hope Christ raptures us when we're right in the middle of some great truth in this book. It's, it ought to be that real to us. And if that is true, then that means there are others that don't know of this and will not see it coming and will not be prepared and need our faithful, divinely enabled witness. I believe if you study Revelation the way you should, you'll lead people to Christ as a result of it. Your heart will break. Tears will flow as you see people that have no clue what is shortly to come. And it's not an arrogant pride. It's a broken, God, use me. I'm humbled by what you're revealing. I want others to know of it through my lips and through my life. So there needs to be godly witness. And I hope as we study, you'll be attentive in that way. Look for that. How can I witness to this? How can I share this and do so with love and truth? Number two. We also must be attentive with God's words. Notice now in verse number two, he said, or three, he said, blessed is he that readeth, all right, there's the witnessing, and they notice that hear the words of this prophecy. Hear the words. Not only is there a blessing for each individual who reads the book aloud, there's also a blessing for each person who hears it and takes it to heart. One of the things that we will do as we study the book is we will not just with broad strokes just kind of paint our way through the book. What do the words say? How does it apply? And going through it in a way that is faithful to the words of this prophecy. There, are, And I will just say this, I've heard some even allude to this. There's no magical power about reading this over and over this book and you just read it and I read it and all of a sudden we conjure up some blessing. It's talking about we live in light of it. We prepare for it and therefore receive the blessing that comes from truly hearing and doing the Word of God. Which leads us to our second point. Then look, if you will, at the end of verse 3. And here is the key transition as we prepare tonight for our study 
and it's found here at the end of verse 3. Notice, so we read it, we hear it, notice, and keep, and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Number two, we must be an active student. We must be an active student. Um, if you're doing and being what you were before studying through this book, you miss the whole point of the book. The Word of God changes us, right? It transforms us, it improves us, it adds certain things and takes out certain things. And there's some application that must be made. And Christ, through John, says, I want you to keep these things. I want you to apply these things, to do these things in a way that pleases the Lord. Two areas. Number one, we're active as a student when God makes application. And specifically, you notice he says, keep those things. Keep those things. There was a story in the news yesterday, or I believe it was, uh, what's today, Sunday? Yeah, I guess it's Sunday. Uh, Thursday, <laughs> Some, it's been a busy week for all of us. Um, there was a story in the news on Thursday of a lady in Ontario, just beyond Mansfield. So this is a local story that was on the national news. I don't know if you saw it or not. But they arrested her and charged her uh, through a surveillance video footage they had from a, from a cemetery this lady had stolen a stuffed animal, and she had this, con I mean, again, innocent until proven guilty, but just something about it didn't ring right to me. She had stolen a stuffed animal off the grave marker of a family who had lost their young daughter back in 2007. And she took this stuffed animal, off. I don't know what she was going to do with it, but she took that thing they had put there, and she had this story about some dog was running around, she was trying to save it, and somehow she didn't return it or try to direct it their way. And so they have arrested her for taking a thing that was not just the thing had value, but what it was connected to, just the, I mean, disrespect of that act. Do you know the things we're talking about are things that God has not just revealed to us, but they're the things He's doing. It's what He's focused on. And therefore, if they're important to God, think about it. God has... God has a lot going on, and yet He takes the time to do things, and to say things, and to reveal things. And so we must make sure that we apply those things in our hearts and in our lives. While some are thrilled by this new study, you know, some get excited about studying a book like this. If we're not careful, sometimes we don't see the value and significance of these things and how important they are in our day-to-day -day lives. Go, if you will, quickly. I think we have time to the book of James. Just back a couple of books. James. And I just want to, again, these are foundational truths, most of them familiar to us, but they also apply to our study of this book because it is a part of the Word of God, just as any other book is. And I guess as you're turning there, if we're not careful, Revelation is not seen as one of the most practical books. Would you admit that tonight? You know, I, for me, Proverbs would be a very practical book. Do this, don't do this. Um, even the book of James we're going to read is kind of the New Testament version of Proverbs as far as how it communicates truth. But notice in chapter 20, uh, verse 22 of chapter 1 of James that James reminds us of what we're to do with what God gives to us in the area of His words. He says, after talking about receiving the engrafted word, it's to come into us, it's to save us. Verse 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, and I want you to be thinking about the book of Revelation as we read these verses, all right? God, I want to, I want to live this book. I want to apply this book. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, all right, a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful doer, but a doer, or not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of this work, this man shall be blessed in his, what's the next word? Deed. Deed. I think why the Bible has become for many of us when we're not careful and we're not conscious of what God's doing, when it becomes a little boring and a little bland and just routine, we're not looking for what we're supposed to do with it. Um, I'm renowned for not reading manuals, but if I get desperate enough, I'll read them. I'll, how do I do this? 
The Bible, and specifically Revelation, is the manual to prepare our families, to prepare our kids, to prepare our community for things that are going to happen, not just in Iran and not just in Russia, but right where you and I stand and sit tonight. It's going to happen here. What are we going to do? And how are we going to be ready? And how are others going to be ready? And so there's a practical dimension to our study, and we have to stay focused and faithful as we reply to how God applies His Word. I think Revelation has some great applications, tremendous applications, but we have to be looking for them and open to them as God reveals them to us. See, the, the book of Revelation can alarm us, it can sidetrack us, or it can engage us in the work and will of God, in His plan. I want to be more a part, God, of what you're doing and what you will do as you fulfill your promises. It's important to observe that this book, God gives it to us right out of the gate in verse 3, is intended to be a practical study. Not just philosophical, not just academic, not just to entertain us and to give us our imagination something to think on. It's for us to put our feet into and to live in light of. And I've told you this before, but I'll say it again. If you were to ask me, what is the best thing I can do right now in light of all that's going on in this world? Here's my answer. Do the Word. There's something about living in light of this Bible. When I do what it says, now when I read Revelation, it changes for me. You, you've been there, haven't you? I make a decision about my family or my ministry or my just individual walk with God, and I'm doing something with His hurt Word. Now when I read in Revelation, now God's going to do this, and God's going to do this, and it becomes so much more palatable and so much more a part of our existence. And so I just encourage you tonight, as you study through any book, but especially this book, make sure that you look for God's, not my application, but God's application. All right, now lastly, look if you will back at our text here in Revelation 1 and look at um, the end of verse uh, number 3. All right, so he says, keep those things which are written therein. Notice he ends with this phrase, which is, so exciting and yet so also sobering. Notice he says, for the time is at hand. The time is at hand. How are we faithful to make sure that we're active students? First of all, by receiving his application. Number two, by receiving his awareness. And I think the second one really is what enhances the first one. If we're aware of what God is doing, Okay, this is real. Uh, we're going to read through some passages like you. It almost sounds like something right out of a sci-fi novel. You know, H.G. Wells will be proud of some of the descriptive passages of this book. And yet it's not fictitious. It's real. And therefore, it gives us an acute awareness that otherwise would not be possible. The word time that's given here in verse number three is the word kairos, which means a period of time. Uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily that, that the time as in, okay, in the next three ticks of the second, this all is going to happen. But this time as a total, this body of time, this, all these events that will happen in just a few years' time, it, it, it's coming, and it's coming quickly, and the time is at hand. It is a hand's breadth away from us. In fact, several times in the Bible, specifically here in Revelation, it refers to a year as time. Uh, when it talks about the tribulation, it talks about a time. Uh, it talks about then a half of time. And it uses that analogy to add up to three and a half years. But a time, several places in Daniel and also in Revelation, that term time refers to a year. So just make note of that, not necessarily here, but in the future when that word time is used. So time is referring to a period of time. And God is saying that is shortly to come. Now, what does that mean this evening? It means that we ought to have a sense of urgency. And we ought to be preparing for something. If, if I were to tell you tomorrow, I don't know, either something really good or really bad is going to happen, or if I told you tonight, or if I said in the next 30 seconds you're going to suffer some health concern, or you're going to have an amazing thing happen in your life, it changes right now then, right? Because it's urgent. If you're like me, I read some of these past, well, that's going to be, you know, that, that's going to be years down the road. God wants us to live in the imminency, in the, the fact that in an immediate moment, God could break in upon human history. And I think the rapture, honestly, is the next 
event on God's timetable. There's nothing in Scripture that needs to predicate or precede it. It could happen today, tonight. When's the last time you've heard that in church? When's the last time you've talked to that, about that with a, a believer? When's the last time you've shared that with your kids? Man, even my generation, I heard a lot more than I hear it today. And yet it's closer tonight than it's ever been. And there's an urgency, and God wants us to feel that. As we're going through the, the chapters, it's almost like, I don't know if we're even going to get through reading it before this, these events begin to be set in motion. And that is the sense that God's people have always had, who have been true to the book, faithful to apply, and to have an awareness that the time is at hand. In 1 Chronicles 12 and verse 32, it describes the tribe of Issachar, and it says this, And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times. Do we understand the time in which we live, and do we comprehend how that applies and how that moves us forward? Now, may I say this as well. The book of Revelation does not happen in an abstract setting. It's not we live our human existence over here and then over here God begins to do all these weird and cool and kind of spectacular things. Where does God do most of the book of Revelation? He does it within human time. And again, I can't stress enough, I think sometimes we visualize Revelation, but it's in some distant land, it's in some distant time when it can happen in our life, in our land, in our state, in our city. And it impacts the people you love and know and those you meet and those you don't know that you meet. It impacts us. And so there's an awareness that the book of Revelation happens in time. And specifically, it could be much of it accomplished in our time. Um, have you ever watched a movie? It's, I don't even think you need the little glasses anymore, but what they call 3D or 4D. I've seen some of that where you put, I remember when you put on those little uncomfortable glasses, you know, and they don't fit, they're made one size fits all, and as a kid especially, you know, you just, you'd hold them on, you know, to watch what you're watching. But 3D, what does, it, what does it do? It makes something look closer than it is, right? It pops out at you. I think we suffer from the reverse. We see things as being further away than they actually are. It's not too close, it's too far away for us. And God wants us to have an awareness that at any moment, these events could happen. The phrase at hand is found in verse 3. You notice back in verse 1, did you catch it? It says, which must shortly come to pass. So in both verses, he encapsulates this introduction. Shortly come to pass, the time is at hand. There's a sense of urgency. It does not mean necessarily these prophecies would be fulfilled right away in John's day. Rather, it indicates they will come swiftly. And I will tell you, when God sets these things in motion in Revelation, it will just bowl this world over one thing after another after another, and there's not time to even breathe in between. Do we realize that this evening? How quickly, when this clock starts, it's spinning rather quickly, and all the events that go with that. Now, quickly, if you would, go to verse 19. And again, we'll come back to this verse in more detail, but can I give you a basic outline of the book of Revelation? I'm not going to give you a detailed outline, just three points, and I think you probably should write these things down. Let's read the verse, and then I'll give you the application, or the outline tonight. Revelation chapter 1, and if you would please look at verse 19. Now again, we're in the time aspect. We're aware of the times and the book of Revelation is built around time, and we see that here in this verse. He says here in verse 19, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So you have the things which thou hast seen past, the things which are, that's present, and the things which shall be hereafter. Now let me give you in this book of Revelation, at least in broad strokes, strokes what I believe are those three points, all right? First of all, jot down things you have seen, all right? Things you have seen. That's the first point. They're not alliterated, right? This is going to be Bible tonight instead of the preacher's alliterate outline. Things you have seen, and then put chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 20, all right? Chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 20. All right, so that is the things that you have seen. That would be past things, and we'll talk about that as we go through. We'll work through chapter 1 a little more, Lord willing, next week. All right, then second, the second point is this, things that are. 
things that are. And if you would please put down under that chapter 2, verse 1, through chapter 3, verse 22. Things that are. That would be the present church age in which we live, and that's where we'll get into all the letters to the churches and to the pastors and uh, the leaders and servants of those churches. Things that are would be chapter 2, verse 1, through chapter 3, verse 22. And then the third point would be things to come. Things to come. Things to come. And that would be chapter 4, verse 1, through chapter 22 and verse 5. Chapter 22 and verse 5. So things to come, chapter 4, verse 1, through chapter 22, verse number 5. And then you have a few closing comments there in that chapter. But those would be the three um, sections of the book. And as you can see, most of it is spent on things to come. And obviously that is the premise of most of this book. Um, Any of you who watched the film... I watched it obviously after its release, but any of you seen the film A Thief in the Night? Have any of you heard of that? All right, several of you. I remember as a teenager, I think actually maybe preteen, being scared to death. We watched part of that. Some, I don't think it was an official church thing, just some family house. We popped it in and, and we were watching it. But the movie came out in 1972 and they estimate it's been seen by 300 million people. In fact, the... Uh, Left Behind series that came out several years ago, Tim LaHaye and others that help with that, Jenkins, they give much credit to that series, at least laying the groundwork of what then they have done recently. But in the Bible, it refers to the suddenness of the initiation of these events. And I even find it fascinating that God spends so little time on the prep uh, you know, we talk about, was now this the beginning of, of the tribulation or the end of the world? And God really gives us very few markers leading up to it. It's almost like, just get ready because it's coming. That, that's kind of the sense and feel of the book and then spends the balance of the time talking about what those events will be. I think we have time very quickly. Let's look at one verse where that phrase, a thief in the night comes. Second Peter chapter 3. Just go back a couple books again. And I don't know if you've thought about this before, but 2 Peter has a lot of what we would call eschatology or end time events. When I normally think of prophetic books, or I don't necessarily think of Peter. I think of Daniel primarily and maybe Revelation, uh, maybe Ezekiel, some of the uh, Jewish prophecies. But this book of 2 Peter especially has much in reference to, uh, for as short a book as it is, about the end times. But look specifically at verse number 10. Uh, Verse 9, let's begin there. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, as in God forgot to initiate the end events. But His long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All right? That's where we're at right now. Now notice verse 10. But the day of the Lord, and we'll define that in more detail, but that's talking specifically about um, the events that happen after the rapture, I'll give you a chronological time frame that you can kind of build the different events on so you can remember this comes first and this comes second. Probably give you a handout on that. But this begins now the day of the Lord, which would refer to uh, the tribulation and the culmination of all things. He says, The day of the Lord will come as a thief, as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Years ago, I had found out, you know, if you know how the table of elements, Forget which element is the most resistant to heat, but the degrees to which this planet has to elevate its temperature to melt the very elements is beyond even almost our understanding. To literally melt rock, to melt metals, to melt every aspect of it. And notice this is coming suddenly. Melt with fervent heat, and the earth also in the works. That's interesting to me. Everything we've built and piled together and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That right there is a sermon, isn't it? I mean, there's so much in that, just that one verse. The urgency, the futility of what we're doing in this life if it's not connected to God's plan. And so there's a a suddenness, and therefore that should give to us an awareness that God is coming. I believe the pending events recorded in Revelation should evoke a greater sense of urgency and also a greater sense of preparation. 
When's the last time you made a financial decision, a family decision, a ministry decision, an education decision, I don't know, whatever, based on the book of Revelation? I got other books I refer to and quote and read from, but this book ought to define the here and now. There ought to be an awareness that every decision we make ought to be viewed in light of this book and what is shortly to come. The things to come, we spend very little of our time thinking on, don't we? We think about the things that were, think about the things that are. God gives three chapters to him. And he spends the balance of this book talking about what is to come. I think probably our proportions of what we're focusing on maybe should change, to say the least. I remember when my wife and I were married, I still I think I remember the dates coming up here June 1st. And I remember standing uh, at the front of the auditorium and... Uh, in fact, uh, there's a picture we took at our wedding. And the picture is of, you've probably seen couples do this, where, guys, I'm sorry, I know, you know, it was fine when it happened, but, you know, we're men, it's hard to even admit we remember these things. But anyway, I remember there's a picture of my wife and I, and she, basically, it's her and I, we've just committed to one another, and we're smooching it out there, you know, the camera's taking a picture, which is not something I'm real comfortable with. But anyway, we were doing it, and she had her, her veil over my head, like I was under her veil, you could see through her veil, and I was kissing her. And the problem with the picture is this, her eyes are closed, and man, she's just, you know, in the moment, and my eyes are wide open in the picture. <laughs> and that every time she flips through that, that scrapbook, it just drives her nuts. And I, I keep telling, I can't go back and change it, you know? I don't know if my eyes were open, because is she really seeing me? You know, is she really aware of what she's getting into? And I think still, now maybe she does wish she had her eyes open in that picture. But anyway, I remember when she walked down the aisle, I mean, I think I've shared with you before, every wedding has little snafus, little things that just don't go quite right. You know, power goes out, somebody forgets something, a cue is off. But I remember all that is almost like there's the, the tunnel focus, and all I'm doing, I'm just looking at her. I think I've told you, I love to go to weddings and watch the groom watch his bride walk down the aisle. Just see that, that focus. He doesn't care about any other woman or man or person or beast in the room. He's focused on her. And can I say this evening that I think if we're not careful, we miss the message of Revelation in the book called the Bible where Jesus says, look at me. Look only at me. And if we will see the events of this day that are unfolding before us, and I'll admit to you they're a little scary for me too, especially when I think of my kids growing up and Man, I mean, it's not just what's changing, but how quickly it's changing and digressing. I know many of you share that concern for your grandkids as well. But can I tell you, it's the only way we're going to see Christ fully. It's the only way we can get to the end of the story, which ends well, by the way, doesn't it? And for us to get there, we have to go through what was and what is to get to what is hereafter. And if we'll do it with the help of Revelation, I think Revelation is God's attempt to not just give us the right focus, but to encourage us, to engage us, and to help us finish well the course He has put before us. One last verse and we'll finish. Would you go to Revelation chapter 19? And this verse will be the key verse that we will emphasize throughout the series. I would encourage you to memorize the last phrase of this verse. But this is where our eyes and our hearts should be. And when you catch me, saying something that is distracted by the events and circumstances of this world, just say Revelation 19.10 to me. And if you will, let me say the same to you as we keep our focus upon, again, who it's all about. Look at verse 10. John says, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. This is an angel that's come to John and knows the angel's emphasis not to worship him but someone else. Notice, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. Notice the end of this verse. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit. And that word is not just a spirit, but it is the very essence. It's the core. It's the sweet spot of why God has given us prophecy. I believe nothing will bring revival faster to our hearts, our homes, and our church than to realize that a person is shortly to come. And we go from bride to wife. We go from just talking about it to seeing it with our very eyes. 
And in the midst of all of it, we see Jesus Christ. The question this evening is this. Will you be committed to the Bible? Not just the book of Revelation, but the Bible as a whole. It offers revelation. It reveals some things to us we would never know. Dig into it again tomorrow morning. Get in it tonight if you have time and look for what God's trying to reveal. And secondly, number two, read it. Don't just read it in the privacy of your little prayer closet. Read it aloud. If you're able or feel nuts sometime this week, jump up on your rooftop and read it. I'm not saying do that literally, but that's the spirit we need. This, this is, no one else knows what's coming. We do. Share it, speak it, live it, live in light of it. And I guarantee others will make note of it. They'll see the peace, they'll see the confidence. And most of all, they'll see Jesus because you're looking at him. And the glory of Jesus shines in our face as we're witnesses for him. I'm thankful for the book of Revelation. Without it, not just I wouldn't have some cool facts about the future I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know Jesus the way I do. And I guarantee all of us as we go through this book together, we'll know him better than we did the last time we read through this book. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for your word. Lord, what a joy.